Um, I'd now like to welcome uh, Professor Phoebe Barnard. Um, and Phoebe Barnard is a revered colleague on Scientist Warning Europe and a board member. Um, Phoebe is a full professor at the University of Washington um, and has spent much of her career working in the subcontinent of Africa. Um, Phoebe, over to you. Thank you so much, Ed, and thank you, Bill, for a bracing talk. I have, I, I love and hate the way that Bill phrased this for us, horrific but manageable. I hate it because we all know that it is horrific. I love it because I know that it is manageable, but the hill is really steep. How are we going to climb it? We have multiple dimensions of change that need to happen all at once in a vanishingly short time. I'm also a population ecologist by training and, and an evolutionary behavioral ecologist, but for many years I've been working in conservation biology, global change ecology, and science and public policy, mainly as Ed mentioned uh, in Southern and Eastern Africa. And so I feel these things very deeply and uh, I wanted not to take away from the impact of what Bill says. We have to absorb and really um, internalize this message in everything we do. Now, one of the good things that um, having nearly 8 billion people on the planet <laughs> involves is that there's a large gene pool of smart people that can work on multiple issues at once. We are at the biggest crossroads that any of us have ever known in our lifetimes. How will we navigate from this point in time forward? As Bill made very clear, we have a choice. We can choose the path that we're on of gormless denial and failure to grab uh, evidence and reality and embrace positive change, or we can learn from the history of climate change, pandemics, societal economic instability, and the collapse of governments and indeed civilizations. And we can choose to do it differently, but the tasks are daunting. Ed mentioned that uh, the, the scientists warning of a climate emergency paper had identified six areas. And I'd just like to uh, briefly touch on that, if I may. Um, Ed, I'm just going to share my screen for a second. And I, I wanted to remind those of you who have read any of these papers, uh, not only the bioscience paper in 2019 and 2020 uh, online and in print, but also short follow-up papers in bioscience and Scientific American, where we looked at essentially um, in the first case, the importance of carbon sinks, forests and other ecosystems in really taking us forward into the future and how we need to internalize these in our public policy, planning and management. But also in the Scientific American paper, summarizing what had been done in 2020, a year in which we should have expected the planet to have a reprieve, but fundamentally did not. Um, energy, conservation and transitions, uh, short-term atmospheric pollutants, I'm going to bring up a graphic here, um, including methane and carbon soot and so on, nature restoration and conservation, food systems, uh, not only reform of agriculture to a significantly more regenerative agriculture, but also significant shifts in people's diets to draw down the amount of animal protein that we rely on, which is one of the most significant drivers of ecosystem loss. Of course, population stabilization, that's why we're here through very supportive, but also significant uh, changes in public policy, education, economic opportunity, but not just that, that may not be enough on its own and nobody wants coercive, um, 
policy. So we have to focus very much on this issue. And then finally shift and reform of economic goals away from hyperconsumption and private profit much more towards human and planetary health and well-being as we have known for many decades really now that we've got to get to. I was on the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, Board and EXCO and Scenarios Working Group about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, and it's uh, been a really transformative issue for me in understanding not only the, the complexity of the challenges that we face, but also the power of collaborative thinking and problem solving and multidisciplinarity and engagement with public policymakers, planners, community members, and so on to achieve change. So uh, I want to just touch on a few points. One, a lot of people say that population stabilization is a taboo topic, it's touchy, it's had this it, very real history of apparent and sometimes real racism, misogyny, condescension, cultural arrogance. Most of that is completely true. And yet, nonetheless, that does not give us a free pass to stop talking about it. We cannot kick the can down the road any further. People have been saying that it's not population, it's consumption. Bill has shown very clearly, it is both. And we cannot delay any longer talking about both. And with 8 billion people nearly, we've got enough smart minds to figure out how to talk about them both. And I'll, I'll mention some interesting things that we're doing in, in, in a minute. But every baby born today commits us uh, to the use of resources. The net growth of, of population is something that we cannot uh, kick down the road. So I do believe we're out of time. And you know, working in national development and environmental planning uh, in Namibia and South Africa, particularly for 34 years of my working life so far, uh, I realize how quickly development gains can be uh, eroded nationally, locally, globally by population, uh, exponential population growth. A number of people have uh, been talking about the importance of wisdom in the work that we do. Homo sapiens is named this for our supposed smarts We've, we're, we can be great at logic, we can also be great at illogic, but we fail to apply wisdom that we should learn from our forefathers and mothers, particularly uh, taking this into the new generation. So uh, I would like to see wisdom, ethics and knowledge uh, be an explicit focus of the teaching that we do both as parents, if we are parents, and in our schools, in our governance training and everything. Science and sociology show clearly the benefits of having small well-planned families that we can afford. This isn't just about science, this is about ethics, about faith communities, about artistry, about poetry, all of the endeavors of human society need to be brought to bear on this issue. As an ecologist, I know uh, too well that a fragmented state of our planet cannot support life at this intensity. And we are also moving into rapid and uh, really intense climate change that is putting people on the move. I used to work on climate migration of other species, birds in Africa and elsewhere. And now I'm working on climate in migration preparedness of humanity. Big, big issue that will challenge everything that we think we know in our relatively stable, prosperous, and predictable communities. I guess I want to say uh, really just one or two more things. One is that we often speak quite superficially about inequity on our planet. Yes, we have rich 
and hyper-consumptive countries. And those countries need to get to grips with that. But within countries, both in the developed and supposedly developing world, there is great inequity and we need to acknowledge it. There are as rich, obscenely rich people in South Africa, Nigeria, Chile, uh, other countries as we have anywhere uh, almost than, than perhaps the US. And we need to acknowledge those dynamics and how they affect what we do um, in, in our population policies. However, there's a big change in public sentiment in many countries, let's harness that. We need to invest both in economic opportunities and educational opportunities, yes. May not be enough, but it's a very, very important place to start. And focusing on health and well-being, both of humans and the planet and quality of life rather than private profit. History, if we have one down the road, will remember us very badly in the Western world for such an outrageous economic system. And then finally, I want to introduce you, I'll share my screen just for a second again, to um, Girl Planet Earth, which is a really nice, let's see, how can I take this forward? Uh, uh, sorry, Girl Planet Earth, I'm maybe not able to share the screen, I'll try once more. Girlplanet.earth is a new dialogue of women and teenage girls from around the world talking about population, consumption, planetary boundaries, nature, culture, sexual politics, uh, faith communities, and restrictions or guidance on these issues. And it's an important and powerful uh, set of voices that have not been heard. You know, here we are uh, in this panel, <laughs> a bunch of white people from the North mainly, um, talking about issues, but there are powerful and really relevant voices. Um, I would urge you to go to this site being soft launched today and check it out. There are such um, resonant insights and challenges that girls and women around the world are having. And of course, it's not just about girls and women, it's about every young person on this planet. I'd like to see fewer um, gray beards up, up here, myself included, not that I hopefully have a beard, uh, but certainly uh, I want to see more um, voices amplified for young women. And that's what this community and this website tries to do. So I'll leave it there. But thank you, Bill. And I'm looking forward to Chris Tucker's talk and Jane O'Sullivan's talk too. Thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you so much, Phoebe. And you're absolutely right. We can't see any grey beard in sight on your screens.